Hello, everyone, and welcome to my lab. Are you ready to have some fun? Yeah! Are you ready to learn? Yeah! Well, let's get started then. I have a sparker over here, and now... You know, in my lab, we have a lot of exciting experiments. I want you to pay close attention to what's going to happen. I want you to be on the lookout for loud noises, for color changes, for smoke, for fire. Try to think about what you see. Try to connect what you see with other things that you may have learned before. In my lab, we practice safety. I want everyone to notice that I have my goggles on to protect my eyes from potential splashes. I put my goggles on because it is the state law. I'm a law-abiding citizen. <laughs> I also do it because it's good practice. I want everyone to know that I have a fire extinguisher right here, ready to be used, just in case something goes out of control. I'm not planning on anything going out of control, <laughs> but it is a safety precaution. In fact, I'm going to set it aside right here where you can all see it and I can reach for it as need be. Now I want to come back to the experiment that I did before where I had the sparker, a plastic bottle with two nails stuck on the sides. They're not touching on the inside. They're separated by a distance of about half a centimeter. At the bottom of the bottle, there is a, a small amount of a clear and colorless liquid we call alcohol, and there's a cork on the top. What I'm going to do is use the sparker and touch one of the nails to see if I can make the spark jump across the gap that separates the two nails. Okay, so are we ready for this? Here we go. That's an example of what we call an uncontrolled combustion reaction. The alcohol vapor inside the bottle burned and ejected the cork way up there. That's an experiment that simulates what goes on inside the internal combustion engine, where you have a piston, you have spark plugs, and you have fuel that burns. And that we want the burn to be smooth there, not uncontrolled combustion as we have seen over here. I would like you to welcome my very long collaborator and friend, Dr. Rodney Schreiner. Rod? Hi, Rod. Hello, Sam. What do you have for us today? Well, I have a tube made of copper, a long tube, as you can see. At one end, it is connected to a hose which is connected to gas. Across the top of the tube are a lot of small holes. And what I'm going to do is turn on the gas so that it flows into the tube. And what's the gas going to do when it gets into the tube? It's going to come out, right, through these little holes. Now what does gas do when you put a flame near it? It burns, yes. So let's see if, it, if the gas is coming out. It will burn. Now the flames are very hard to see. As you know, that gas burns with a pale blue flame, but I can tell you it's quite warm here. Now at the other end of this tube is a loudspeaker, like the speaker from a radio. And if I connect it to an electrical signal, it'll make sound. I have a generator for that signal right here, uh, which I first need to plug in, and then uh, I'll connect it to the loudspeaker. This, this signal generator produces a pure wave. So uh, it'll produce a wave of a particular frequency that uh, corresponds to sound that we can hear. And when I turn it on, you can hear the sound. And uh, there's a number on the front of the dial which tells us what the frequency is. It's about 950 cycles per second or 950 hertz. And that corresponds to the sound that you hear. Uh, what I'm going to do is change the frequency that goes to the speaker. I'm going to increase the frequency, and you'll hear a change in the sound, 
but you'll also hear a change or, or see a change in the gas flame. But it'll be easier to see with the lights out. So uh, let's, we'll wait for the lights to go down, and I will change the frequency. So now in the dark, I think you can see the flame. And I'm going to increase the frequency. What happens to the pitch as I increase the frequency? It's going up. What happens to the flame? Notice at some spots, the sound gets a little louder. Like right now, it's louder. If I turn it up, it fades a little bit, and the flame goes uniform. And as I turn it up a little further, it comes to a spot where it's loud, and we get alternating bright and dim spots in the flame. It's higher, I hear. OK, let's try it higher still. There is another one. So I'm going to back it down just a little bit so we get a few more of these bright uh, spots spread out a little more. The reason we get these bright spots, right, like this, we get bright spots because the sound is a wave, a pressure wave through the air. And where the pressure is higher, it pushes the gas out. And so we get a bigger, brighter flame. Where the pressure is lower, uh, we get a smaller, dimmer flame. And those spots where the sound gets louder and the uh, flame gets these nice, bright spots in it, that happens whenever the length of the wave matches the length of the tube. So what you're doing here is actually seeing sound waves. OK, so we can have the lights up. Thank you very much, Rodney. Really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. I'm going to use liquid nitrogen, which is a very cold substance, minus 196 degrees Celsius. It's kept in what we call Dewar flasks or thermos bottles, right? This is thermos. And you can see the liquid uh, in these unsilvered Dewars boiling. That's because the temperature of inside is not quite the same as the liquid nitrogen uh, temperature. And what, what I'm going to do is take this brass ball and this brass ring. You can see that they, I can put the brass ball through it like that, just right, you can see that. I'm going to take the brass ball and cool it in the liquid nitrogen. You can see the liquid nitrogen boiling. That's because the brass is at a higher temperature than the liquid nitrogen. And when the boiling stops, then we know that they are both at the same temperature. Also, I have this metallic strip. It's actually made of two different metals. One side is brass and the other side is um, steel. And what I'm going to do is take this bimetallic strip and put it in the cold liquid nitrogen and we'll see what happens to it. Just dip it in there for a few seconds and lift it up. You see what happened to it? That's because the two metals expand differently as the temperature is cooled down or as the temperature is heated up. This bimetallic um, strip that I have here is very similar. In fact, it's identical to how the thermostat works at home. So I put it back in the cold liquid nitrogen. I reach back here. I have some hot boiling water. By the way, you notice how I can pick up the beaker right away at the top here. Not here. I can't do that. I can, but I shouldn't do that because I'll burn myself, right? Now watch and see what happens. Here is the bimetallic strip in the cold liquid nitrogen. Now I'm going to put it in the hot water. And you see what happened near the bottom where it got heated up. Now it's bending a little bit in the opposite direction. Not at the top because the liquid water is not uh, coming up all the way to the top. So this is a bimetallic strip that can go one way or the other depending on the temperature. So I go back to the brass loop that I have here. I take the ball and I put it in. It doesn't go through. So temperature affects metals, right? So what do you suppose I should do 
to try to make the ball go through? Put the ball in the hot water? Put the ring in the hot water. Okay, let's try that. I put the ring in the hot water. I like audience participation a lot. I like that a lot. And we'll wait a little bit so it warms up a little bit, right? And how do we know if we waited long enough? We try it, exactly. I take it out and try it. Hey, that was long enough, right? It can go in and out again. As you know, we have many people who enjoy doing research in my lab. And at this time, I'd like you to meet one of them. Uh, her name is Krista Stewart. Please welcome Krista. Hi, Krista. Hi, how are you? Fine, how are you? How's it going today? Good. What do you have for us? I have some household chemicals that I've been experimenting with lately. I'd like to show you what happens when I mix them together. I have some vinegar, some baking soda, some laundry detergent, and some food coloring, and a glass of water. And what are you doing now? I'm putting on my safety goggles. Of course. <laughs> I'm going to start by putting in a spoonful of baking soda. And then a spoonful of laundry detergent. And then to make things more colorful, food coloring. And then we're going to mix it up a bit. That's always a good idea to mix things up, isn't it? <laughs> and finally, the vinegar. Whoa. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. It's a neat experiment. I like that, Krista. I like that very much. Uh, I noticed when you came, though, you brought something else with you. What is this? This is a bell made from lead, but it doesn't work very well. It sure doesn't. Do you have any cold liquids in your lab? Yes, I have liquid nitrogen. That would be great. You like to have some of that? Yeah. All right, here's some liquid nitrogen. And... I know that things act differently when they're cooled, so I'll try cooling the bell. And how can we tell that the lead is at the same temperature as the liquid nitrogen? It when it stops bubbling, yes, yes. We have a lot of good research students in the making in the audience, yes, yes. That's better, isn't it, right? That's better. Very good, Krista. Very good. Now when the bell rings, it, gener it makes vibrations, you know? Sound energy has, is the result of vibrations. You make, you knock on the table, you move your vocal cords, you push the air, you have, make sound waves. Now Krista, I know that you have other ways of making sound waves, don't you? Yes, I play the violin. Do you happen to have it with you here? I do. <laughs> The violin is made of wood, and the strings are made of steel. To play, I move the bow, which is made of wood and horsehair, across the strings. That was very nice, Chris. That was not nice. Very nice. Now that was a simple scale, Krista. I, I know you can do a lot more, can't you? Sure, I'd love to. All right.
that was just beautiful. And that's what we try to do in, our, in my lab, to, to link science and the arts together. And then, uh, Krista, she's a student in, in high school. What year are you in, Krista? I'm a sophomore. She's a sophomore at Middleton High School, which is just outside of Madison. How old are you, Krista? I'm 15. She's 15 years old. And I want to tell you something else about Krista. She's received many, many awards for her talents. And next month, she's going to be a featured soloist in Carnegie Hall. Now, there are other people in my lab who experiment with sound energy, and uh, I think it's time to uh, call one of them out here. What do you think, Krista? Let's, Let's call do it. Mark up. All right, come on out, Mark. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mark. Welcome. What do you have for us today? I have an oboe and a reed. The reed makes the sound. There's two little pieces of wood that vibrate against each other, and when I blow across them, they make a very beautiful sound. It sounds like this. I thought you said beautiful <laughs> sound, Mark. <laughs> well, maybe I should try it again. Getting better. Getting better. Well, usually it works better when I put the reed into the oboe. The oboe is made of wood and also has, in this case, gold keys. And as I add fingers, the vibrating column of air inside the instrument gets bigger and the tone gets lower. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, of course, this is Professor Mark Fink from our School of Music and the principal oboist with the Madison Symphony Orchestra. Another person who has also been working on sound energy in my lab is Professor Mark Vallon. So, Mark, are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> Mark, hello. What do you have for us today? Well, uh, this is a bassoon, and it's a bit of a similar instrument to the oboe. It's got a reed, this vibration device. It's a larger reed, makes a different sound. <laughs> I can play a tune for you also, but it will be a bit different. <laughs> and if I... But then if I put the reed on the bassoon, well, first thing, if I blow on the bassoon like this, you can hear the air going through the pipe, but it doesn't really make a musical sound. I couldn't play a whole concert like this, so I put the reed <laughs> on the bassoon, and then I can hope to play the bassoon a bit. Very good, very good, very good. Play something else for us, please? Yeah. Yes. Three of you play something for us together. We'd be delighted. All right, I'll get out of the way then. <laughs> There's a particular a form in music 
that is called in music a cannon or a round, similar to when you sing row, row, row your boat. And we have three such cannons to play for you today. The first one you may recognize is Hey Ho. We'll have Krista demonstrate the tune and then uh, the second time we'll all play it together. So you notice that this piece we just played, uh, Krista started the piece and I finished it. Now it's my time to start the piece. <laughs> piece was written by a great composer by the name of Johann Sebastian Bach. It features Krista and myself playing uh, the same piece, uh, same tune, separated by a little time duration, a different tune being played by the bassoon. the Science is Fun Trio. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I have a clear and colorless liquid that has in it some household ammonia and some silver nitrate. I'm going to put that in there. That's the first liquid. And the second liquid is a sugar solution, except it's not sucrose, it is dextrose. So I add the dextrose in there, and what I want to do is get that rubber stopper on again, and of course we have to mix the chemicals together, and you can tell already that there is what? A color change. A color change is an indication that a chemical reaction is taking place. Do you see what I see? I see myself back here. <laughs> so what we've done here is make ourselves a silver mirror. So the reaction between the dextrose and the silver nitrate in the ammonia solution resulted in the deposition of a thin film of metallic silver. In fact, this is how silver mirrors um, can be made. And thank you. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, you've been a wonderful audience. I really want to thank you for coming to the 35th anniversary of this very special program. I wish you the best in whatever you do. And remember, no matter what you do, that science is fun. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.